Parisa Tabriz started as a hacker. Now she's known as Google's security princess, tasked with protecting the data of billions of users around the world. And because she oversees Chrome browser security and Google's security research team, Project Zero, she's all about web security. So she'll be interviewed now by TechCrunch's Carly Page. Round of applause, everyone. Thank you. Marisa, thank you so much for, for joining us. It's awesome to be here. Okay, so you have quite the job. You're in charge of Google Chrome, which I'm sure most people in this room use, along with billions of others. Um, what are you seeing as the biggest security threats facing these users today? Uh, well, awesome to be here. Um, awesome, awesome to see lots of folks here and have this conversation. Um, and yeah, I'm responsible for Chrome today. Started uh, Google a while ago working on security generally, and then came to Chrome to work on security and now look at the whole browser, which is both you know, end user product as well as a, a platform. And so we think about both uh, you know, people using a browser on their desktop computer, uh, Windows, Mac OS, maybe a Chromebook, uh, people using a browser on their phone, uh, it could be Android phone, iPhone, and then also the platform and the web platform at large. Um, and thinking about how do we help developers or what are the, some of the threats that developers face. And we're super lucky to have a lot of people that use Chrome. And so um, as the browser's gotten more popular over the past uh, 15 years, we actually just celebrated our 15th birthday this year, the uh, attacks have um, also increased in terms sure. of range of attackers and um, you know, number of attackers, I, I would say. Um, you know, typically, a product launches, nobody uses it. You don't have too many attackers facing you. And so like, it's, it's, a, it's a good problem to have. Um, and we um, face threats you know, that are sort of, of the broad spam, phishing uh, attacks to end users, as well as hyper-targeted attacks that are really looking at you know, a patch gap between a security bug that we just fixed and uh, you know, the window by which a user is going to be updated, which um, now you know, can be a week. And so it's, it's not a big, a big window. And I think uh, with that ends up requiring just a, a really multi-pronged approach in terms of how do we approach security to uh, you know, defend against all of those attacks and attackers. And uh, it's been an interesting you know, journey in security because some things are always the same, like you have untrusted input, and you know, that typically is how you're going to run into security problems or security bugs. And like, in some ways, that's been a theme since I've been working on computers and, and computing uh, for the past two decades. On the other hand, things have gotten so much more complex and, and advanced in a lot of ways. And uh, one of the uh, things I love about the space and browsers and, and the web um, and security is just like you're constantly learning and adapting and really thinking about how to be pragmatic and protect people from real threats given sort of there's no perfect solutions to the space. Absolutely. And when it comes to protecting all these people, what are the biggest challenges faced by you, you and your engineers? Um, Lots of challenges. Um, I would say, uh, you know, I started my career in more of security consulting uh, mode, and you weren't really close to kind of the product or the business. And so you think about like common patterns of problems, and then you end up kind of handing this over to a different team, and they have to figure out what to do with it. Um, working in Chrome now, um, I think about how do we build a product that is secure, and I think about how do we make it safe by default, but also fast and usable and simple because. You know, we know that people are choosing to use software because it's easy to use and it's fast. Like that's one of the most important features of, of any product or service. And the challenge is often in that trade-off space of like, how do you build something that is secure um, and fast? And um, you, you want to optimize for both. And then when you get kind of into the details, some of the security protections that you want to build in, like exploit mitigations, um, okay, that's going to like take extra uh, checks in code, and so like, ooh, that's going to actually impact performance. And so that trade-off space is um, uh, something that 
is just a, a real challenge and one that we face every day. Security and performance is one. Security and usability is one. You know, we have a wide range of users, each with different personal preferences or even, um, you know, kind of threats that they're thinking about. And there are uh, some users who want to make sure that they're opting into the most advanced security protections. And they have a higher threat profile, uh, journalists, you know, politicians, uh, you know, um, lots of vulnerable populations who are, are really wanting to opt in um, and take on additional protections, and some people that don't want to. And so how do you support kind of that range of, of users, make it simple to use, make it default, but then also give um, options in a way that doesn't result in just like hard to use complex uh, um, crappy software is, is one of the big challenges I face. I think another thing is just the space moves so fast. And um, you know, I took an artificial intelligence machine learning course in college. Uh, and, and for me, that was kind of a while ago. Um, and I mean, it, it was kind of lame then. And now, <laughs> I think even just in the past six to 12 months, what we're seeing is made possible by um, applications of, of LLMs or Gen AI. Um, it, it both, you know, is, I'm learning so much and trying to learn so fast, and the, the pace of, of innovation and opportunity is, is happening really fast. And so one challenge is also just learning and how do you stay like on the cutting edge, both in terms of building defenses, but also knowing that you know, bad actors are also taking advantages of advances in technology. And like, this means that it's going to be harder to defend against those. Sure. I guess from an outsider's perspective as well, another challenge for you and your team must be balancing privacy and security. So it's no secret that's where Google makes its money. It, it collects user data for advertising. How do you ensure the security of your users while balancing those privacy considerations? Um, well, I think that um, security and privacy are super related. Um, and uh, for Chrome, which is probably where I'm the closest to, you know, we've had um, an investment in privacy since the beginning, even before, since, before I worked on Chrome. Um, our privacy team is... Uh, pretty international. Chrome's a pretty international team. Um, probably the biggest part of it is uh, in Germany, actually. And um, I spent some time in Germany, and I actually think in a lot of ways, um, thinking about kind of uh, privacy and some of the features we need to build in, some of the data protections we need to build into the browser, um, like some of those early insights came from our team, you know, outside of the, the, the US. And um, that's you know, building incognito as a, as a feature, building options, and um, you know, more recently, how do we make security, privacy features like, more comprehensible for people to understand those, those trade-offs? Um, so s super top of mind, I think um, in Chrome, uh, we think about the web and how do we make the um, web a really thriving ecosystem. And, and one of the things I love about the web is uh, I think it's so related to Google's mission of universal access to information. And universal, in a lot of ways, is you know, free in some ways. And um, you know, I've been working on the web for a long time. How do we ensure there's great content on the web? How do you ensure it's free? You have to make sure that people can have you know, businesses and monetization. And so like, ads is, is a part of that. And that's you know, been the, the primary way, I think, a lot of people who've created uh, you know, create content on the web actually can do that in a sustainable way. So, you know, ads are, are part of the web and the ecosystem. And I think within Chrome, um, we have both invested in making sure we're mitigating security attacks from ads. Um, I remember uh, for a while that was, you know, a vector for drive-by malware. And so, like, how are we actually investing to make sure that ads also are not introducing security risks, not creating crappy experiences from a performance standpoint, or even just from like a, uh, a user experience standpoint, and acknowledging that, like, hey, that's an important part of even just content on the web. Um, uh, so again, a trade-off space, and and whether it's you know, security and privacy, or just thinking about kind of um, uh, ads content on the web, um, I think of these as complex problems and complex ecosystem problems, and ones that continue to advance, and that we think about a lot at Google, but also get feedback on from you know, the rest of, of the world, too, to make sure that we're continuing to adapt to kind of user expectations norms and also you know, ultimately making things better. Sure. So speaking of complex problems, you also run Project Zero, which is... They are a complex problem. <laughs> no, I'm just <laughs> Which is Google's team for finding uh, zero-day vulnerabilities in products. Yep. I think you found 
I don't know how many this year. A lot? A lot this year. A lot, year. yeah, yeah. Is it a bit of a game of cat and mouse? You find these zero days, next week there's more. How do you, how do you deal with that? Yeah, uh, so Project Zero is a um, security research team. And um, they, the, uh, the mission is to make zero days hard. And um, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say that I don't uh, know what birthday they're on, um, but they've worked really closely with uh, Chrome, Android, other parts of Google, but actually are a vendor agnostic team. So they don't, you know, I have a product security team with Chrome that really focused on making Chrome uh, secure. Project Zero is just like, hey, attackers don't care who made the software. Um, and so they're going to really focus on, f with an attacker mindset, how to mitigate, make zero, day zero days, make zero days more expensive. And part of it is vulnerability research. They have a, a blog um, where they're regularly publishing research. Um, and they have a attacker mindset, but it's ultimately to make defenses better. Um, and we'll share very detailed analysis of how to write an exploit because it also makes um, defenses uh, easier to build and really to understand very practically how these things uh, happen. Um, team has, you know, they do vulnerability research. Uh, they've also helped establish kind of industry dis norms on, on disclosure, um, really striking that balance between uh, making sure vendors have some space to be able to address really critical security bugs, but also making sure that there's transparency to the, to the public about um, what issues exist. And so I think, um, how do you approach this? It's one, a mix of like incredible security research, technical talent, um, and, and sharing learnings uh, broadly. Um, I think that's maybe the second one too, of transparency and really working with the broader community versus just keeping your learnings to yourself and then I think um, you know Project Zero has also worked to actually build mitigations too. And so uh, for me, people who are some of those brilliant minds and have the biggest impact are those that actually work kind of on offense for a while, and then will work on defense and really manage to kind of get both perspectives. Because if you're focused too much on one, you sometimes I think can lose either empathy or understanding from kind of the, the I guess the cat or mouse uh, perspective on that. And um, yeah, I, I uh, am proud of the team and also proud of how the team works with so many other security researchers um, in the broader industry. Uh, and uh, yeah, like I think they've had a lot of impact and there's clearly a lot more impact to have because we haven't solved this problem by any means. Sure, and to the founders in the room, how can they stay on top of these threats that haven't even yet been discovered? Um, uh, I would say to the founders in the room, um, one, it's great if you're in the room because it means you're thinking about security. And I actually think the first, the first thing is probably just even thinking about security and acknowledging there's a problem. Um, second, I would say like try not to get overwhelmed by it because uh, you know I have a pretty big team focused on security. And, and if you're a founder and kind of in an early startup phase, you might be like, if you know Chrome can't solve it, like how will I be able to solve it? And um, you know, y'all are balancing probably like getting some customers. And so, if you don't have customers, don't worry about protecting yourselves from the nation states because the nation states are not, are not going after you until you get some customers. And high level, I think being aware of security um, uh, and having that as a consideration choice. Because look, if you have an incident or attack, it's going to impact your brand. It's going to impact. It could lead to fines. Could lead to opportunity cost. And ultimately, people choose products and services that they trust. So it's important. Um, one thing I say is, you know, someone needs to own security. Um, if everybody owns it, nobody owns it. And at a certain point, um, you know, you, you, you really should identify one person. And they don't have to be the, the expert, but they need to be able to own it and figure out the experts and figure out kind of, you know, from an infrastructure standpoint, from a corporate, you know, uh, security standpoint, like what are your risks? And like, you know, what decisions are you making that are actually going to impact your corporate security long time? Same with you know, product and services. And um, usually around like, you know, when you're seven to 10 people, you probably should have somebody who owns it. And if you don't have someone else named the founder owns sec security. Um, uh, I tell people to think about like the, the infrastructure, the open source projects or infrastructure you're, you're uh, choosing to use because that becomes your dependencies that you take on um, and, you know, security bugs abound and like those, those, services or projects that you're depending on, like what is their patch plan? How are you going to approach their patch plan? Because um, that's typically, I think, how people get into trouble, like these dependencies. Um, 
I think identity is important because if you're a startup, you know, people are coming and going. And so how are you provisioning, deprovisioning uh, new employees uh, that come? And, um, you know, as you scale, you have to uh, adapt. Uh, and um, uh, it's, it's tough, but totally manageable. And I would say that um, uh, in some ways, you know, it, it's just a space that moves so fast where you don't have to worry about becoming an expert because you're just constantly kind of a, a adapting and figuring out um, how to approach it hyper specific to kind of like what is your your company's uh, mission and objective and I think those are those are some things that are top of mind absolutely and another thing I want to touch on is diversity um, I think the industry has long had a diversity problem it's improving but we're still not there yet for the founders building out security teams what what does a diverse team look like um, yeah I think that Security has improved somewhat, but there's still a, a long way to improve. And I think sometimes when people hear diversity, they're like, you mean women? And I'm like, no, it's not just women. It's not just skin color. Um, and like, yes, those are, those are uh, aspects too. But I also think even just like functional uh, diversity of, of skills and representation. And a thing I love about cybersecurity is it's so interdisciplinary. And so people who, I learned so much from people with a legal background, comms, uh, background, you know, a, a government uh, background versus academic versus like completely practical and self-trained. And so I think that you, you, you know, independent of what you, is the right thing to do and it feels like the right thing to do, I actually think it's just critical to actually building a strong cybersecurity uh, s strategy team and uh, um, to, to find uh, diverse talent. And um, one of the things I've enjoyed is I've had a chance to work a little bit in academia and and then a little bit with sort of, um, you know, hackers who are self-taught, many of whom dropped out of school, and then also a little bit with um, the government. And so you, you, there's so much actually common mission and desire to work together, but also very different perspectives that, that come to the, the table. And for me, I, I do a lot of hiring, whether it's security or just, um, uh, you know, any role. I'm looking typically for someone who's got a growth mindset, is curious to, to learn, has demonstrated ability to learn and actually like willingness and openness to kind of learn more. And it's so important for security too, just because things move so fast and you're just constantly learning. Um, and then someone who's, who's hardworking. And I actually think that um, those things, if those are your top attributes, they really broaden your aperture of like who you potentially want to take bets on. Um, I look at that so much more than, you know, what love, what acronyms and, and kind of what previous jobs are. and you know, those can be signals too, but I think that the, the broader the pipeline, um, or the broader the aperture you do, the, the broader the pipeline you can have for talent. And uh, I, I think it builds better teams and is also pretty important because there's, we have a supply and demand prob problem Absolutely. too. And so finding the people to take bets on um, is important. Can you give an example of where having a diverse team has worked, has proved successful in the area of cybersecurity? Yeah, I mean, um, so for Chrome, you know, when I, when I joined uh, the team, uh, took on the team, it was about six people, fantastic uh, group. Three of them were named Chris, so like, we did not even have name diversity. Uh, um, uh, all deep experts in system security and software security. Um, and, you know, a thing I realized, hey, we're building a product, so like, cool, we, we've, we have a lot more work to do as it relates to fuzzing, sandboxing, and these technologies. But also, like, we have nobody who's thinking about the usability of security warnings. And so many people run into kind of like phishing, malware warnings. Um, and we didn't have anybody who was like passionate and, and wanting to focus on some of these important usable security warnings that practically were probably a bigger threat to like users at large. Uh, and so, you know, a hire that I did intentionally was to find someone who had PhD in human computer interaction. Um, and uh, I remember actually kind of even within our, our team, it was like, oh, but like, will they like the team? And like, you know, they don't, no one said they weren't named Chris, thankfully, but it was like, this person doesn't fit into kind of what the, the team, you know, mold looks like. And so, um, uh, uh, but, you know, they came in, forged uh, alliances, partnerships with our design team, who at the time was kind of, you know, annoyed with our security team. Security team was annoyed with the design team because in some ways you're speaking different languages. And um, it ended up kind of being the formation of 
our usable security team, which um, I think in this case, actually, it, it, it did improve gender diversity within our team. But to me, it was actually even more critical that it was just a skills diversity perspective. And um, I think uh, you know, we found people who are performance experts to come and work on security or security experts to go work on performance. Mm -hmm. And I think that just builds better problems because you get somebody who has just a different perspective looking at the same problem. Um, so. Sure, and we're rapidly running out of time somehow. And um, people want to go to lunch. <laughs> I'm keen to hear about what Google is doing internally to protect itself against attackers. It must be targeted quite frequently. Um, this summer it was reported that Google was running a pilot program where it was giving employees laptops without internet access, is that correct? Ooh, I don't know. And this is okay. not my area of expertise. Okay. Um, and so I'm a little bit nervous to talk, talk to it because um, I know we have teams of, of hundreds of people thinking about how to protect Google. And yes, like we're being uh, 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 attacked kind of from all, all angles. Um, kind of like want to phone a friend and like ask Heather Adkins to answer this question. But, but, or, or we might go to a different one because I'm not as close to that. Sure. I guess my point here is we see headlines all of the time about high profile cyber attacks affecting everyone, tech companies, gaming companies, casinos. Google is rarely in those headlines. What is it doing differently to protect itself? Um, well, I think, um, you know, and Google had, has gotten hacked. Uh, Operation Aurora, now this was maybe a decade ago, um, was, was a pretty big profile uh, hack. And we were sort of transparent about what had happened. And um, since then, I mean, we, we invest tons in actually um, making sure that you know we're evolving Google's infrastructure to uh, you know in some ways assume like hey maybe some employee has been hacked how do we mitigate the actual risk of that especially when it comes to user data so some of its access control like I don't have sometimes people are like hey can you help me you know debug this thing in Gmail I'm like I'm not on the Gmail team I can't help and also even <laughs> my access is limited even within Chrome because now I'm like a manager and so like I don't you know, need access to kind of some highly privileged uh, um, environments. So some of it's access control. Um, some of it is investing in great talent, thinking about um, technology and processes um, because the, the threat is, is, is super high. Um, and we're very proud that uh, there's not headlines on it, but that doesn't mean that there aren't, you know, issues that we, we work on um, and, and address. And in, in some ways, part of it is an architecture of how do we mitigate knowing that just we're constantly under, under attack. Sure. And I think we have time for one final question from me. So if you could do things differently, if you could go back and re-architect Chrome with cybersecurity in mind, what, what would you do differently? Oh, um, let's see. I try not to live a life of regret. And just uh, like software, it's you know, constantly evolving. Um, and uh, I think of it like as this organism that you constantly you know, need to um, invest in. I probably would say that um, one of the things we're focused a lot on now is memory safety issues. Like these things still happen. And C++ is in some ways a very powerful language. And you can do things that can really optimize for performance. It also um, is a language that can lead to a lot of problems. And we still run into you know, various memory corruption bugs. So a thing that we are. Um, focused on now is like, how can we experiment with Rust or other memory safe uh, languages? And it's, it's hard to kind of retroactively do that. So if we're starting from scratch, maybe think about uh, language choice. Um, uh, and uh, it, it's, it's, it's hard to know because, you know, tech advances. And uh, 15 years ago, that, that wasn't really an option. And so in part, some of what we try to do is like, look at the state of the world today and like what's happening and how do we apply this to Chrome is kind of the, the continual thing that we think about. Brilliant. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank that was you. a fascinating tour. Thank you. It was super fun. Thanks, Thanks guys. Everyone. Enjoy lunch. Mm -hmm.